Thank you. And thank you, Yuval, for uh, the introduction and for organizing this workshop. Uh, I think uh, cryptography has really been uh, leading in a lot of ways in theoretical computer science. A lot of the things like interactive proofs uh, actually originated from cryptography. So maybe even this workshop should have been called Behind Cryptography rather than Beyond Cryptography. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, optimal algorithms and uh, assumption factories. And uh, uh, so at some points, I'll mention some works, some of which uh, have been published, some of it have not yet uh, been published by um, uh, several, uh, joined with several people, including uh, uh, Tzvika Bakersky, Sam Hopkins, uh, Ayush Jain, Ilan K, Pravesh Kotari, Ohan <laughs> Kumoit, and Amit Sahai. <laughs> OK. So let me start with talking about something that I see as a, a puzzle. So in cryptography, we're kind of used to the fact that uh, you know, uh, people have uh, sat down in the, the 1970s and looked at a problem like uh, you know, the RSA problem, and they try to, uh, you know, they try to, there are obvious ways to solve it, and they couldn't, and it has withstood until this day. So in some sense, we have this intuition in, uh, in crypto that uh, um, if you think about a, a particular uh, hardness assumptions, if it doesn't get broken, uh, it's probably is because it's actually inherently computationally difficult. And um, in other fields, people have some kind of the opposite intuition. They think like most problems are actually easy. They are easy and less proven otherwise. So you know, uh, almost every problem they solve in machine learning is NP-hard. And they still solve them all the time, like uh, you know, uh, optimizing over deep neural networks or any, anything like that is always uh, NP hard, and they still solve it every uh, every time. Also, if you look at economics, uh, even though we have all these proofs that uh, reaching equilibrium uh, is computationally hard, uh, they are somewhat unfazed by these proofs. And they, you know, one way uh, Eva Tardos once told me that they, they phrase it: there is milk on the shelf, so there is obvious proof that people manage to find equilibrium. That uh, you know, the stores and the customers manage to come together in equilibrium, even though uh, we have all these theoretical proofs that uh, this is supposed to be hard. So. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> You're right. There are shelves. That proof that there is no equilibrium. <laughs> well, Amazon doesn't have shelves anymore. Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, in some sense, it seems like uh, if you think uh, uh, in all these fields, people kind of uh, think uh, if you think of uh, hard versus easy problems, then uh, they think that the problems of one type are a small island in a sea of problems of the other types. But uh, crypto and, and ML and econ disagree what is the island and what is the sea. Is the sea hard problems and there is a small island of easy problems, or is the sea easy problems and there is a small island of hard problems? Um, so this is somewhat of a puzzle. Um, what, what's, is, should we think of a problem as easy and less proven otherwise, or as hard and less proven otherwise? And, and, and maybe in some sense there is not as big a contradiction. Because if you think about this, first of all, in crypto, we have these kind of ideas of what is the best algorithm to apply for a certain uh, class of problems. So we have these you know, generic group models, random oracle models, uh, et cetera, where we try to capture what's the certain uh, types of algorithms that could be applicable to attack a certain, uh, a certain problem. And in you, if you look at machine learning, it's also not as if they believe problems are easy because uh, whenever they're faced with a new problem, they would come up with a brilliant, new, and unexpected algorithm. They always use the same algorithm. So, uh, so they also have the intuition that for the class of problems that they are interested in, um, if they are solvable, they usually maybe are solvable, but they are solvable by this kind of algorithm. And in uh, economics also, what people do is not, you know, um, a market doesn't run, I don't know, Strassen's uh, fast matrix multiplication or something like that. It uh, runs uh, basically uh, conversions to an equilibrium by uh, some kind of uh, best response dynamics where, you know, uh, people modify their prices based on supply and demand. So, so in some sense, both, all of these, crypt uh, these fields the intuitions agree with something that is a little bit different than what we learn in you know, algorithms one-on-one. -on -one. So 
if you learn in into, uh, an intro to algorithm class, then probably you've learned it from a very thick book. And, uh, and the, the thick book kind of describes it as if there are like all these problems, and for every different problem, you come up with a brilliant different algorithm. But maybe in real life, it's more the case that, you know, all sorts of problems in a certain domain are solved by the same algorithm. And, um, and if that algorithm doesn't succeed, then no algorithm will succeed. So that's kind of the question I want to uh, talk about. And, and the, the question is, in some sense, do, do, should we expect to have like an optimal algorithm for a wide, a wide range of problems, not all problems? And um, what kind of an uh, algorithm could be optimal, and what, what uh, can we use such, uh, such things for cryptography? And let me say that I'm going to focus, in some sense, uh, I'm going to do the equivalence of, of uh, searching uh, for your keys under the street light, in the sense that I'm going to focus on the uh, easier class of computational problems uh, for which we could uh, maybe more reasonably hope to understand this kind of um, optimal algorithm. I'm, I'm going to co focus on combinatorial types of problems, which in crypto land uh, might correspond to private key uh, uh, things like, uh, you know, pseudo-random generators. And uh, in algorithmic optimization, we'll talk about uh, satisfiability, graph problems. In some sense, maybe the, mo the things that are most interesting to us is to understand the difficulty of problems like, you know, lattices, factoring, uh, where they're more algebraic nature, they're more public key, and they also where uh, quantum and uh, uh, quantum speedups uh, seem to become possible. But uh, maybe if we first understand, get a good picture of of uh, the combinatorial domain, we can move to the algebraic domain. And this is not very well defined, and I'm not going to also, it's one of the, pro I think, uh, main questions in this research agenda is how to define what is combinatorial, so, and I don't know how to do it yet, but I'll give you some kind of buzzwords or intuition. So the maybe prototyp prototypical combinatorial problem is satisfiability, and maybe the prototypical, prototypical algebraic problem is integer factoring. And uh, you can think of it as, you know, satisfiability, you want to maximize some objective. In integer factoring, you want to kind of put together like a very rig uh, rigid puzzle. And in some sense, if you think about what is combinatorial versus algebraic, we think of, you know, maybe in combinatorics, we, we're talking about maximizing number of constraints satisfied. It's more like inequalities versus equalities. In algebraic things, we have more types of interesting constellations. We're talking about exact. And uh, it's more about rigid structure, like less, less about noise. But again, these are buzzwords or intuitions. And uh, for now, let's see, let's use the kind of I know it when I see it kind of, and, and focus on things like satisfiability, uh, very simple pseudo-random generators for these lectures, and uh, certain graph partition problems that somehow seems like they are more combinatorial in nature. Okay, and the algorithm I'm going to uh, talk about as a candidate for being an optimal algorithm is the sum of squares algorithm. It uh, was uh, proposed uh, by several researchers, including Shaw, Perillo, and Lasserre. And this is kind of a meta algorithm. It's meta in two ways. First of all, it's, it's not an algorithm for a single problem. You can kind of uh, ap apply it to really a wide range of problems. In some sense, any problem, you, uh, any problem in NP or something. Like and, uh, and it also uh, has a tunable running time parameter. So, uh, so you can also tune the, the algorithm for both the problem and for how long, how much of a uh, budget do you want to give it to run. So, um, so you can ask the question of how fast it uh, runs on a particular uh, instance or particular problem. And it's Kind of a common generalization of linear programming, semi-definite programming, spectral algorithms, and uh, also encapsulates some kind of uh, many combinatorial types of algorithms like local search and, and greedy. And indeed, in many cases, you can show that it captures the state of the art in the sense that whatever algorithm gives the best known performance for a certain problem, some of squares will also uh, embed this algorithm. It's not necessarily the way you would want to run it because uh, it will involve like solving a huge semi-definite program, which uh, is polynomial time but not really efficient, but, uh, but it does embed it. 
And in fact, in many cases, uh, it is the state of the art in the sense that the best known algorithm uh, we know was uh, obtained through this, uh, through this uh, uh, algorithm. And, and the, the reason I'm interested in this algorithm is that in some, on one hand, it's powerful enough that you can make the claim that it's plausibly optimal in um, some range of parameters. And in fact, you know, if so-called, uh, I'm not going to focus on worst case settings in this talk, but uh, for worst case setting, there is formal conjectures, uh, unique games conjecture that says it's, uh, if, it, if it's true, then this algorithm is optimal in, uh, for all constraint satisfaction problems. And so on the one hand, it's powerful enough to be plausibly optimal, unlike, say, uh, things like uh, restricted models like uh, AC0 or something like that, where, or, you know, DEP, DEP2 um, bounded fun, you know, like these kind of models which we sometimes prove low bounds for, but they are not very restricted. But, but it is still weak enough so we can rigorously analyze and show that it fails on a certain... Um, so, so it's not so powerful that basically uh, proving that it uh, fails sometimes is as hard as proving that P is different from NP. So, so it seems to uh, kind of strike this balance which makes it uh, quite interesting. So um, not going to go over all this list of, like these, these are uh, specific cases uh, where recent work has shown that uh, the sum of squares algorithm um, gives the uh, better results than were known before for a variety of problems. So um, uh, a lot of problems come from uh, uh, machine learning, but some of them also from quantum information theory or you know uh, combinatorial optimization, etc. And this is just a partial uh, list from of more recent work. And this talk, I'm going to focus on the relation between sum of squares and uh, simple pseudo-random generators. And I'll start by a brief overview of sum of squares, and then I'll uh, talk about how it applies to pseudo-random generators. But uh, I do think that this optimal algorithm paradigm could be uh, relevant uh, outside of pseudo-random generators. And specifically, I'll talk about uh, some attacks on pseudo-random generator candidates that were recently proposed for, uh, for obtaining uh, uh, indistinguishably obfuscators. And uh, some evidence for uh, the security of other pseudo-random generators, which at the moment seem to be just beyond what we need for obfuscators, but uh, are still very interesting uh, in their own right. Okay, so these are the two parts of the talk, and I'll, I'm going to start with uh, part one. Okay, so I'll talk about what is this sum of squares algorithm very briefly, and then uh, how does it apply to uh, pseudo-random generators. So the sum of squares algorithm. This is, by the way, a spectrohedron, which is kind of the object that uh, you optimize over in this algorithm. So the sum of squares proof system, is, so basically the algorithm is obtained from a proof system. And what is the proof system? You're trying to prove a statement that uh, of the following form. You want to say that uh, for every x that satisfies a certain uh, polynomial inequalities, um, it, uh, it also satisfies another inequality. So that's the kind of statements you're trying to prove. And this can be very general because you can uh, write, like for example, you can uh, uh, express something like uh, x is an independent set in a graph as a set of polynomial inequalities. You know, you add the equality xi squared uh, equals xi. That says that x, every entry of x is either 0 or 1. And then you can add like inequalities that say it's an independent set. and so, you, for example, if you wanted to prove a statement like every independent set in a graph um, has size at most, uh, at most k vertices, you can easily write it as a, a set of, uh, you know, a statement of this form. So these are uh, polynomials uh, or invariant polynomials of the reals, and the axioms we'll use are very simple. One axiom is that uh, a square is always non-negative, and uh, other axiom is that if you know that for every x in, uh, that satisfies your condition, p of x is uh, non-negative and q of x is non-negative, then p times q and p plus q are also non-negative. And this simple proof system turns out to be complete. Every two inequality, every two statement of this form can be proven using this proof system. And this is a result, uh, like a fundamental result in uh, real algebraic geometry known as the positive Stenelsatz. 
and uh, it arose, it's like a generalization of um, uh, the solution of uh, Hilbert's 17th problem. It said that every uh, non-negative polynomial can be expressed as a sum of squares of rational functions. And um, now you can also keep track of what is the maximum degree in the proof that you used, and uh, the way we'll do it is we will keep track of syntactic degree, which means we don't allow cancellations. Uh, if P is degree D, Q is degree D prime, we say that P Q is degree D plus D prime, and P plus Q is the maximum of the degrees. Uh, even if for some reason there was cancellation, we kind of just keep it syntactic. And then it turns out, and this is this sum of squares algorithm, that you can find degree K proofs in time, which is basically N to the K. So if K is constant, this, uh, this is polynomial time. So basically you have this sum of squares proof system. It can prove anything, and it has a parameter called the degree. The smaller the degree, the better the running time in actually finding proofs. And one example of something you can prove with this uh, is, like, say, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, we can think of it as the following theorem. You know, the, uh, the, dot, uh, the dot product uh, of P and, P, uh, P and Q uh, is uh, smaller than the product of the norms, you know, uh, let's square both of them. So the dot product squared is smaller than the product of uh, the norm squared. And, um, and you can just write it, uh, you know, you can just open it up and see that this is a sum of squares. So you can express it as, a, a, and, you know, you just, uh, you just write the left-hand thing is obviously a sum of squares, so it's obviously no negative. And then you, you open it up and you see that uh, this is really equal to uh, two times the polynomial that's, uh, 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 two times uh, the thing that's, that's above. So, it's the, so that's a proof it's not negative. You just express it as a sum of squares. OK, and there are like many other uh, uh, results showing that uh, lots of interesting uh, theorems have low degree sum of squares proofs, and uh, also some results showing that uh, so interesting statements have a high, uh, require high degree sum of squares proofs. And the one thing that I want to make sure uh, to emphasize is that low degree sum of squares proofs is not the same as simplicity for uh, humans. So you can have like things like these uh, results on uh, majority is stablest, uh, which are like papers that were in the annals of mathematics and, uh, and uh, uh, still can be proven using this sum of squares proof system uh, with only a constant degree. And on the other hand, you can have like the result that a random three sat formula is not satisfiable, which is like five lines using the probabilistic method, and that requires a very large uh, degree for sum of squares. So these two, uh, the notion of having small, uh, small sum of squares degree and the notion of being simple proof in what we think of it as intuitively is not the same thing. But the important thing is lo lots of interesting, interesting statements can be proven with uh, low degree sum of squares proofs with the probabilistic method being a, an important exception. So how does this sum of squares algorithm work? So I'll just give you a cartoon of it. Um, uh, so this slide may or may not make a lot of sense, but if it doesn't, then you can just ignore it and say, okay, there is this algorithm, it, it just works. So the idea is the following. Think of like a statement like the, like the simplest thing. Think of a statement we're trying to prove that there is no x that mutually vanishes on all these polynomials. So it turns out that the sum of squares proof of that, you can uh, collapse all, this, uh, all the derivation steps and say at the end it has the following form. It says uh, it has the form minus 1 equals p plus s, where p is the sum of p i q i for some arbitrary q i, and s is the sum of squares. Now, if you think about it, uh, p, if there was an x, uh, which va where all of these pi's were van uh, would vanish on, then p of x will have to be zero, s of x would have to be non-negative because it's a sum of squares, and then you would get uh, a contradiction that minus one equals a non-negative number. So, so this is a proof. Uh, so this is a proof that there is no x that uh, if you assume that uh, there is an x that uh, p one of x p uh, and p two of x all are zero, then you get a contradiction. So this is how this sum of squares proof looks like. And if you think about it, it's, uh, if you look at uh, two, two convex combinations, if you look at some P and S that satisfy this e equality star, 
and then you look at some P prime and S prime that satisfy this equality star, and you take a convex combination of them, it also satisfies this equality star. So that means the, the, this is a convex subset. And uh, it turns out that this convex subset is uh, like a nice convex subset that can uh, you know, be expressed basically as a spectrohedron. So you can find, um, so you, you can determine whether this convex set is empty or not using uh, semi-definite programming. So that's really kind of very much a cartoon, but that, that's basically uh, how the algorithm looks like. So it's semi-definite programming to search for these proofs. And the number of variables uh, you need to, in this program is n to the k, where n where k is the degree. So now, if I confused you, and I think there is a good chance I did, let's uh, just uh, kind of step back and say, what is the take home message? So the sum of squares proof system is on one hand powerful. You can prove many uh, theorems using low degree uh, sum of squares. On the other hand, it's what's known as automatizable. So you have an algorithm to find proofs like that uh, uh, when they exist. Oops. And the uh, third thing, it's useful because uh, the, the, it gives you like this algorithmic paradigm that can, you can use for many, many problems. Um, and uh, I haven't demonstrated it to you, so write a list of all sorts of problems. And we can also wonder whether it's optimal in the sense that, because it does seem to capture the state of art for lots of problems often. So you can uh, wonder if maybe that's uh, it, when that fails, nothing succeeds. And that's basically would be the sum of squares optimality conjecture. And if you assume that this is optimal, then you basically get an assumption factory in the following sense, that uh, for every concrete problem, um, y y if you show a sum of squares uh, lower bound for it, it and, and you assume that uh, sum of squares is optimal, then you immediately uh, get a conjecture that this, uh, or the assumption that this uh, problem is hard. So, so this kind of, uh, so if you, if you believe and are able to state a, a, a conjecture that this is, uh, the sum of squares is optimal in a certain domain, you basically get a factory that gives you uh, many concrete hard, uh, hardness assumptions uh, for very uh, concrete problems. So let me now move to part two and talk about uh, the relation to pseudo-random generators. So talk about simple pseudo-random generators. So simple pseudo-random generators, one way to think about it is every output pseudo-random generator takes n bits, uh, expands it into m bits, where uh, if, uh, so it takes a seed of size n and outputs a lo longer output of size m where m is bigger than n. And, um, and you can define what does it mean simple. So the one notion of simple is that every output is just, you know, uh, say depends on just five input bits. Another uh, in, in more refined notion was recently put forward is that every output depends on, say, just a few blocks of the input bits. So think of the input, the seed as coming with a larger alphabet. And you can also think of a uh, degree of it as a polynomial. And, and the, the, these have been widely studied. And uh, let me just give you kind of like the flavor of some results. So people have shown that if, you, if these simple pseudo-random generators exist, exist you get all sorts of cool applications. Uh, for example, a constant overhead uh, multi-party secure computation, or you can reduce, there is a, a work of uh, Rachel Lin uh, of uh, reducing uh, the requirement uh, to indistinguishability obfuscation to just constant degree uh, maps. And if you assumed even more simple pseudo-random generators, so if you assumed super simple pseudo-random generators, then you can get magic. And by magic, I mean you can get uh, this obfuscation from standard assumptions, just uh, by linear assumptions. What's and super simple? So, so super simple uh, will uh, see it in the, but uh, roughly speaking, degree three is simple, degree two is super simple. So, um, yes. so uh, and, and, and one of the things is like understand what, uh, yes, what, what will happen. And we'll focus on the degree case. There have been also works on locality, et cetera. So think of uh, every output uh, is just a degree d polynomial if you think of it as a polynomial of the, over the integers. And, and there was this work of uh, Lin and Tassau that shows that if you have this notion known as block locality, which is kind of a weaker, uh, it's kind of a stricter notion just being just simply degree two, it's some of degree two of a particular flavor, then you can get indistinguishable obfuscation, this holy grail of crypto uh, under basically standard assumptions. 
Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in work with uh, Bakersky, Komardowski, Kotari, and also there was a simultaneous work of Lombardi and Vikans, uh, and V, uh, we uh, <laughs> showed that uh, some of squares breaks block locality to uh, pseudo-random generators. And very recently, there was a, a, a work that's showing that you can relax uh, the assumption in two ways. First of all, only need the agree to, and certainly you kind of need a weaker notion than being like a full-fledged pseudo-random generators, and you can still get the same uh, 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 conclusion. And very recently, in work that's not yet uh, put online, we show that uh, some of squares strongly breaks these degree two pseudo-random generators, so it also breaks the kind of assumption that were put in, uh, in these uh, recent works. And, and this is what I'll uh, talk a little bit now, um, I'll mention um, um, now a little bit more, although again, not with so many details. So how do you break these degree to pseudo-random generators? So the idea is you think of the following. Think, think of these inputs as, uh, you know, you, you get in, um, uh, think of now your goal is to break it completely, so you really want to recover the seed, not just uh, uh, maybe predict uh, or distinguish from uniform. So you're getting this G1 of X till GM of X, you're getting these outputs for, uh, of degree two polynomials. You know the, the polynomials, but you don't know X. And your goal is to recover X. So the way we look at it is we rephrase this question and we think of it as the following. We think of this unknown X as being a rank one matrix. And then this G1 till GM, instead of degree two polynomials, now we can think of them as linear measurements on this matrix. So we're getting these M linear measurements, uh, M linear uh, functions, the output of M linear functions on this uh, rank one matrix X, and our goal is to recover X. So this is just a rephrasing of this problem. But if we rephrase it this way, this is becomes like a problem that people actually have studied. This is known as the low run recovery problem and has been studied in, uh, to great depth and, and et cetera. And it's known that to be solvable using semi-definite programming, which is a special case of sum of squares, if this GI satisfies the condition known as matrix restricted isometry property. And uh, we showed that basically all the candidates that were recently put forward do satisfy this property. And, uh, and that's uh, about as much detail I'm going to show. Uh, it turns out that you can actually, uh, this SDP in this case is simple enough, you can actually run it uh, in, uh, you know, uh, it's about five lines of Julia code. And, uh, and you can show that uh, basically, um, in th this case we ran it like, um, so uh, we got like, uh, when M equals N we got uh, we got already 75% agreement with the, we covered something that was 75% close to the original seed, and uh, when M is like 2N, we basically recovered completely the, the original seed. Yes? Did, did the transition? So the, the particular candidates that there they, they do, have to sati they, they do satisfy it, I believe this sweep condition is not needed for PLGs, but then it becomes a little bit, uh, uh, more delicate because you can you can probably make sure that you don't reco uh, you don't recover x by for example just ignoring information about say half of the bits of x and then you will not satisfy the rip condition but it also doesn't seem useful in that sense so uh, but I think basically any candidate where uh, the the polynomials are drawn from some distribution and each coordinate is drawn iid then uh, the fairly weak conditions on the distribution that will ensure it satisfies RIP if M is, say, N times polylog N. So, um, so, so let me say why do people study this matrix recovery, and that also will bring us to the uh, distinction between simple pseudo-random generators and super simple pseudo-random generators. So why did people uh, study uh, matrix recovery? They didn't do it uh, to break pseudo-random generators. Uh, one of the motivations was something like uh, the Netflix problem. Uh, so suppose you are uh, given, um, so suppose uh, you know uh, you you are, uh, you are like a streaming service and you have some reviews of user for movies, and now you want to predict what uh, what the, what the user uh, will like about movies that they didn't see yet. So another way to say it is that you have this matrix uh, of users versus movies, 
and you have uh, some observations about it, you have some measurements about it, which is the um, ratings that you, you have, and you want to complete it. You want to get the, uh, the entries that you don't have. And how do you do it? The, the idea is that you kind of think of it the following things. So you think of each user, they have a certain things they like and th certain things they dislike. So, you know, maybe they like kids' movies, they, they, you know, they, they dislike action, maybe they like horror or something like that. And each movie has a certain features. And basically, the rating of, a, of, a, uh, the rating of, of a user is kind of like a, up to some noise. It's like a dot product of, of the vector of the features of the users and the vectors of the features of the movie. And this basically means that this matrix X is low rank. So then it becomes really the low rank uh, recovery problem. This is with measurements that are particularly like looking at just coordinates of the matrix, but you can generalize it to any linear measurements. And then this has been very well studied and uh, widely studied. And you know that if, say, R is constant, in our case, R is 1, then uh, you only need basically O of N or tilde of N observations, uh, which means, uh, which corresponds to you cannot get a pseudo random generator that stretches too much. So that's basically uh, why these results end up breaking degree 2 pseudo random generators. Um, yes, but integers, but they are embedded in the wheels. So it's kind of uh, all, uh, as opposed to, yes, finite field, yes. Yes. And, uh, and now you can ask also, what, what, what does the degree three, uh, say, pseudo random generators correspond to? And that will correspond to a problem like tensor recovery, which is also well motivated. So, for example, sometimes maybe uh, the particular movie uh, you want to watch uh, somehow uh, depends on the time of day, you know. Uh, for in my household, for, for example, um, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the movies we tend to watch at Netflix at, uh, you know, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, on a Saturday when uh, the uh, parents are maybe trying to sleep and the kids are awake, uh, it might be very different than uh, the movies we watch on uh, 11 p.m. when the kids are, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, like, you know, my kids just, uh, you know, watch deep, deep, uh, deep educational uh, documentaries while, you know, I just wait until they go asleep so I can watch Barney. So, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, so, this, so sometimes maybe the, you know you have like this kind of tensor where it's uh, where it's like a three-dimensional thing you want to, uh, and it turns out that there uh, there is a difference uh, or it seems to be a difference. Uh, Some squares does recover, but it needs more measurements. In particular, if say think of d as equals to three, like it's a three tensor, then uh, you need n to the 1.5. Think of the rank as constant. You need n to the 1.5 measurements as opposed to only essentially n measurements. Uh, so we know how to, rec uh, so the, we did it approximately, Potechin and Story did it exactly. We know how to recover with n to the 1.5 measurements. Uh, and it also follows from some previous low bounds that sum of squares actually does require exponential time for uh, if you have less than n to the 1.5 measurements. So this leads to this conjecture that maybe the maximum output length for a pseudo random generator is uh, if the pseudo random generator is of degree d, then it's uh, roughly n to the d over 2. So, you know, degree two, basically, it's roughly n, so it doesn't really have, like, significant stretch. Degree three might have stretch n to n to the 1.5, degree four, n to the n squared. And if you believe that sum of squares is optimal, then basically this is the, the, this kind of conjecture. So basically it says, you know, if you think of a uh, super linear stretch, then you can break, uh, you know, these PRGs when they are degree at most two, and the known lower bounds show that sum of squares, at least, will require exponential time where the degree is three or more. So you could maybe, so this is obviously insecure, uh, and, but you could conjecture that uh, degree three or more is secure. And that's basically how you could, if you believe in SOS optimality, you can transform an SOS low bound into a you know, cryptographic hardness assumption. And, and in particular, people have been working very hard uh, on trying to use that cryptographic hardness assumption as a basis for basing obfuscators on uh, uh, standard assumptions. And if you kind of say, yes? So, but when you say uh, <clears throat> some squares um, require a certain time, is it for particular candidates of PRG? Yes, so you have to give a particular candidates, uh, like say, if, in that case, like, for, but many candidates actually it requires uh, exponential time. Uh, but, for, yeah, in particular, like random things. Uh, yeah, you have to be not silly, like, in some sense, uh, for, 
not, not do, there are some kind of silly things you can do, uh, which even in the grid 100 will not be a secure pseudo random generator. In particular, you can have a bias or something. So if you kind of step back, uh, like we, we have a, a similar issue with both, say, machine learning and crypto, where we deal with average case hardness. And uh, how much time do I have, by the way? OK, so I'm, I'm very good. Okay. So uh, yes. So, so if you can, uh, 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 so, so both machine learning and crypto, they, they deal with average case harness, which uh, in, in, uh, basically machine learning, we try to solve it, uh, you know, so in, in, uh, and in both cases, we basically cannot really use NP harness to uh, get insight for it. And in some sense, it's very hard for us to even use reductions at all. There are very concrete cases where, uh, Cynthia knows well, there are like worst case to average case, uh, worst case to average case uh, reductions, but in many of these cases, uh, we don't know. And also, um, in, 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 in many problems, uh, the, uh, the type of NP hardness reductions, they modify the distribution. So uh, they will not give you hardness on, uh, of a problem on a natural distribution. So NP hardness gives us very limited uh, insight uh, on difficulty for these, both these fields. And maybe this is, uh, again, like a, a case where they, both these fields agree in a sense that uh, machine learning, uh, people are not worried. Uh, ma machine learning uh, are not worried when, uh, uh, when, when a problem they're trying to solve uh, is NP hard. And cryptographers have learned uh, the hard way, the, the lesson that they should not be rest on their laurels when the problems that they're trying to base their crypto system is on is, uh, is NP hard. Uh, so, so both fields kind of, uh, kind of agree that NP hardness is not the right uh, measurement of, uh, of difficulty for. Um, and, and in some sense, yeah, so machine learning you try to solve and you're happy if you succeed. But in crypto, we are like in more difficult situation because, you know, you try to solve it, but if you can't, you, 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 you just hope that no one can do it. And then in some sense, if you have these optimality conjectures, we can maybe make, rather than basically uh, the idea of like uh, the cycle of, uh, you know, build, uh, pray, break, we could maybe get a more systemic way to uh, analyze this problem and this kind of assumption factory. So to do that, we really need some kind of formal optimality conjecture. So let me talk about this sum of squares optimality conjecture. So the current status of the sum of squares optimality conjecture is the following. This is my conjecture. <laughs> so I haven't yet been able to formalize it, but I conjecture that it is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so a conjecture that the reason is uh, some of squares, uh, so maybe this is the meta, the, uh, some of squares, the meta, <laughs> some of squares optimality conjecture. Um, maybe there is even a meta meta where there is, uh, I conjecture that there is some optimal algorithm. I don't know if it's some of squares, and I conjecture that for this algorithm there is also a conjecture. <laughs> but, uh, so, so the main bottleneck is in some sense, what does it mean to be combinatorial? And what's a clean general way that doesn't seem like, you know, you're really tailoring it to the five big cases where, um, and in some sense, again, like the, I know it when I see the definition, it basically talks about, say, constraint satisfaction problems, certain graph partition problems. And, and more generally, the intuition is basically if some squares is plausibly optimal when you're talking really about approximating solutions in cases where it's not, uh, it's not as if you, you, you uh, maybe you don't get your instance precisely, uh, you, you get it up to some noise. So uh, like, you know, linear equations, but noisy ones. So you're really talking about approximation versus exact. And you're trying to optimize over kind of nice low degree varieties. So what are nice low degree varieties? One is like the Boolean cube, the unit sphere, uh, low rank matrices or uh, low rank tensors. These are the kind of things that are like, uh, there are, might be technical ways to try to phrase nice in terms of Grobner basis or something like that, but basically it's, um, uh, so you're trying to basically have some kind of, so it seems like these two, two concepts are important there, that you're trying to optimize over a relatively nice space, but nice can be the Boolean cube, which is not easy, it's, just, it's nice, but it's not easy. And, uh, and you, you're not talking about exact, which is kind of crucial to avoid issues like the fact that Gaussian elimination unfortunately exists, um, which of course, I think every cryptographer has struggled at some point with this uh, annoying fact. 
that uh, Gaussian elimination exists. So, um, so, so, so the formal statement is still a work in progress, but uh, I do think that the, my, there should be one, and, uh, and I think it would be very interesting uh, for cryptography. In some sense, uh, one way to think about it is the following. So, so typically, if you construct, a, a crypt, you have a crypto paper, you put it on the ePrint, you try to make your assumption as weak as possible. That's sometimes why you have like, uh, you know, you, 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 if, if you know some caveat, uh, that you only need in your assumption, then you add it. That's why like assumptions in uh, crypto maybe sometimes have like, uh, you know, five adjectives like linear, DT, Elman, in that and that, because you kind of try to, you know, assume the least. So that is, uh, and in some sense, the optimality conjecture is uh, sort of the opposite uh, philosophy. It's like uh, instead of, uh, you know, assuming the least, you say, you know, I say speak loudly and carry a big bullseye on your back in the sense that uh, make a very bold assumption and um, which is basically an assumption factory, which makes it easier to break in some sense, but also might, make, may, might mean that uh, you, if it survives, then uh, you're more confident in it because it's not very tailored. Uh, you know, you, you didn't invent it just for this particular, it, 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 it's as far as you can from the assumption that uh, the construction is secure because our conjecture is that the construction is secure. And then, so I do think this is very useful for, for uh, cryptographers to try to think about these kind of meta assumptions. And, uh, and, and in some sense, they had, like in the general group model, et cetera, although in cryptography, sometimes you have this annoying thing that whenever you try to formalize these kind of generic models assumptions, uh, you, get up, you get something that's obviously false. And, um, and my hope is that there is uh, there, like a, a concrete con conjecture you can make because it's really not a generic or black box type of assumption. The sum of squares algorithm has full access to, uh, say, when it solves SAT, it doesn't treat the formula as a black box. It has full access to it. So it's not an ideal model type of assumption. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it, it has a chance of uh, being one that you can formally specify. Yes? Well, I, I would not, uh, I mean, actually, like, uh, I think that would be, like, too delicate. And in some sense, there, there have been kind of works where you basically, you can use, uh, there is the fege kim uh, in interesting uh, thing, which is not an algorithm as much as a, a, a certificate, but it uses, it combines, actually, SOS and, and Gaussian elimination. Um, I, I, I hope that the, basically the idea would be that if you add noise to your problem, then algebraic algorithms like Gaussian elimination, Strassen, et cetera, they go out of the picture. They basically, you, you, you moved your problem into the street light where you know, the Gaussian elimination monster doesn't lurk. Uh, so, um, so once you add a noise to your problem, I, I hope that uh, the only candidates can be these kind of more uh, continuous optimization or, uh, algorithms and, and not Gaussian elimination. It feels a lot more like moving it out of the street. Yes, I guess it depends. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the streetlight there is not necessarily the easy part, but rather the part maybe which is more analyzable. Uh, yes? You have to think the context in which you have a SOS lower bound, an SOS lower bound, but you should have one of the time. Not Gaussian elimination. Yeah, so that's the problem. Like, basically, Gaussian elimination is like the. I mean, I guess it depends, like, defining Gaussian elimination is a little bit hard because you, for example, you could uh, basically say um, you could uh, possibly modify your input. Uh, so, you know, for example, ga Gaussian elimination over, uh, you know, what group or something like that, you could uh, maybe present your input uh, as, uh, as something that where it's not obvious, it's not like X or something like that, it's not obvious that it's Gaussian elimination, but, but it is... Uh, but it is after uh, you know you, you interpret like your input in the right way, then it turns out that it's it's embeddable in say some abelian group or something like that. And uh, in particular, for some pseudo random generators, for example, it seems like you can have these uh, say non uh, non abelian uh, 
uh, non-abelian non uh, linear equation problems, which Gaussian elimination doesn't apply, but for breaking the pseudo-random generator, it only uh, matters that uh, there is an abelian group hiding in there, so somehow if the group is solvable, it might still, you, you could still break it. So sometimes you might need Gaussian elimination, but you need, uh, you need to massage it. Uh, and the fege kim Ofek is a very nice thing, which I cannot talk, uh, explain the details of uh, here, but it's again, like it's a very nice thing where it kind of combines Gaussian elimination, but not just by running it as a black box. It's more like uh, uh, finding some subset of the su subsets of, uh, of your formulas where you can run Gaussian elimination on these subsets. Uh, yes? Yes. 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 So that that. Right. Yes. So that that's actually like a great question, which maybe leads me to uh, the next slide. I, mean, I think actually uh, that's all. That's the definition of a, a great question, right? That leads you to the next slide. Uh, so 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 in any case, I just want to uh, uh, say that. Um, even if you don't think, if you, you think I'm kind of full of shit and, uh, you know, and sum of squares is not optimal, it still makes sense if you're like proposing a new assumption on uh, something that, where sum of squares could be applicable uh, to use it as a sanity check. Uh, so that's definitely uh, the case. Uh, and let me say, uh, and, and, and jump maybe exactly to Vinod's case, like there, there is this issue with sum of squares, right? Uh, 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 sum of squares kind of is, uh, really makes sense for problems that are presented as low degree polynomials over the reals. And if you look at certain cryptographic problems that feel to us maybe combinatorial, like uh, say block ciphers where they have more depth to them, or uh, as opposed to just one round function, or, um, or parity with noise, uh, they, uh, the, the, the problem is somehow not naturally a low degree problem. So it seems like sum squares is not applicable even though it does seem combinatorial in nature and understanding exactly, and understanding whether there is a generalization of SOS or there is a way to view things that still place this in the combinatorial domain. It's also very interesting for both parity with noise and the learning with error problem. It seems that these are problems that change their nature when you change a, a quantitative parameter. So, for example, if you look at learning uh, with errors, so we know there is a certain regime um, of the noise magnitude where the problem is NP-hard. Then um, you reduce the noise to a certain level. It's no longer NP-hard. It's in NP intersect NP, and then it becomes useful for crypto, and maybe it feels a little bit algebraic. And then you reduce it, uh, so you reduce the noise even more, and at some point, it just the problem just becomes in polynomial time. So it seems sometimes like the you can have a phase transition where the nature of a problem changes where you change a parameter, uh, a, um, a quantitative parameter, and, and that's, again, something we don't completely understand. And, um, and, but it seems like more noise makes it more combinatorial, uh, super less noise could make it either easy or maybe algebraic. And, and and I should say that there is, after we have applied this, the, which was joint work with actually Ayush and Amit, who are like a part of this, uh, of this IO paper, now they have a new uh, PRG conjecture, which is somewhat between degree two and degree three. So it's somewhat, uh, and, and it has a, a, this actually interesting mix of algebraic and combinatorial because it's kind of like degree three, but they reveal something under LWE. So this is something we have not yet analyzed and it's, not, we don't yet, uh, at least I don't have yet good intuition for it. So, uh, uh, so this is one co very concrete open question to understand this con uh, conjecture which they have. And um, we really want to understand where these kind of sum of squares could be applicable and how we could apply it to other crypto settings where we, polynomials seem larger, a higher degree, at least naturally. And there is this work on uh, trying to understand like difficulty of uh, sum of squares and getting lower bounds in the natural thing to apply for lower bounds is when it's unsatisfiable, but we want to understand when it's satisfiable. And there are some interesting new work that tries to uh, con uh, connect it to statistical physics predictions of phase transitions between easy and hard domains. 
and um, you can also ask whether you know to understand the relation between that and SGD, etc. And again, mo lots of open qu questions there, and lots of things we don't understand. And I think um, that's it. <laughs>